Well, we are at the high watermark of the Epistle to the Romans in the minds of most scholars. Most scholars that have studied this book, they regard the Epistle to the Romans as one of the most priceless treasures in the English language, in whatever language, but we're in the English language. Um, and of this incredible epistle, for many, chapter 8 is the peak of it. In fact, um, we're going to spend more than one session on chapter 8 and several of the chapters that follow. And uh, one of the frustrating things about teaching the Bible, and um, I've been, as most of you know, I've been teaching it for more than three decades. Uh, half of that is a layman and half of that professionally. Um, one of the things that's exciting and yet in a way frustrating about the Bible is it's inexhaustible. You can never get your arms around the whole thing and feel you've really mastered subject X, whatever it might be, because it's always still, oh, there's still more to be discovered. And that's especially true of the Epistle to the Romans. Um, when we were in Southern California, we were, for 25 years, <clears throat> we taught the, uh, the uh, studies, the, the Monday Nights series uh, in Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And uh, in that world, <laughs> what we did Sunday nights, Chuck, would Chuck Smith would take us through the whole Bible. We'd go through the Bible. In about two years, you'd go through the whole Bible. And we used to quip that if you want to, if you attend Calvary Chapel Sunday night for two years, you will have been through the whole Bible with a pastor. If you wanted to go through the book of Romans in two years, you went Thursday night, because that's the night they went, they, they had a more in-depth cut at it. And they literally, they literally would uh, uh, do that. And one of the popular commentaries in the book of Romans is the one by Donald Gray Barnhouse, and um, who's a prince in his own right, in many ways. But uh, his, uh, his commentary in the book of Romans is ten volumes on this, on this epistle by Paul. And uh, we're dealing with a document penned by probably one of the brightest minds that had ever been on the planet Earth, and one who had an incredible Greco-Roman education, as well as being precisely and thoroughly taught as a Pharisee. He really understood the law and what have you. So, uh, and his, this is indeed in many respects a masterpiece. It's sometimes called the gospel according to Paul. It's sometimes it's, uh, regarded as the definitive statement of Christian doctrine. So that's what we're in the middle of, and chapter 8 is going to deal with a peak of that. I'm calling it the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Now, we have some new people with us, but also it never hurts any of us to just take a quick context of where we are. In chapter 1, we had the introduction of the book, of course, and it started dealing with the first of three groups, three kinds of people. The first was the pagan man. What about the guy that's never heard, whatever, we've all been confronted with that. And... Uh, so we talk about the pagan man and discover that the creation itself is enough to indict him, to hold him accountable. Then we talk about the moral man. The man is not a believer, but he leads a, what would seem to be a moral life. Why doesn't he qualify? Because it's not moral enough is the point. And then we speak of the third category is the religious man, and he takes for his example there a Jew, but it, it really applies to anyone that would be religious, and we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight as we go. But that just leveled the playing field. All three of these categories before God are still um, indicted, if you will. So God's greatest problem then gets dealt with by Paul. How does a righteous God forgive sin? He can't do it through leniency because it would violate his own nature, one of justice. And yet his love for us gives him that agenda. So that's his problem. How does he justify a sinner without violating his own character? And that leads to the God's greatest gift. God's greatest gift that solves that problem. And that also leads to an acronym. I love what Hal Lindsey uses as an acronym for the book of Romans. He, makes, he builds an acronym on the word grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. So God gives his son to pay the price so that he would have a basis to justify us by, by doing nothing but faith. You try to do something, you're trying to add to something which God has completed. No, no. He's talking about the, the, uh, the uh, that's why we, it's, an, it's a pun of sorts. It's God's grace. God's riches 
at Christ's expense because he paid the price for us. Then we went to the sequence from that to maturity. Just because you're a believer, that gets you into heaven. It doesn't give you inheritance. And so that leads to the sequence, to maturity. And what's interesting is the climax to that sequence is hope. That's a surprise. But we dealt with that in chapter 5. But then we get to chapter 6, which, point, which develops this idea for us that not only are, we for, are our sins for, forgiven, we're justified, our passport is stamped, okay, you can enter. doesn't change us yet. The changing of us is called sanctification. And part of that process is the discovery that we are delivered from the power of sin. For us now, sin is a choice. For the unbeliever, it's not. He's, un, he's in bondage to it. But for the believer, it's a choice. That doesn't mean we'll always choose right. We may fumble. But it is our choice. And we need to understand that. And we need to understand that sin is not going to reign in our lives anymore. There's a big difference between an occasional stumble and having it in control. It's no longer in control. And that led us to chapter 7 in the last session, which I like to call law school. The role of the law is not what most people think it is. The role of the law is simply to show us our need. It's a need that we ourselves can't meet. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about Genesis 3, verse 27, when Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves. And God gave them their first lesson in redemption by seeing, showing them that they needed to be covered by the shedding of innocent blood. Shedding of innocent blood. That was a lesson, a Levitical lesson in advance of what was coming. That was the first act of religion. Man's attempt to cover himself. No, no, it won't work. Only God can repair the gulf between he and ourselves. Which now leads to the high, high water mark, the book of Romans, chapter 8. And the challenge of chapter 7, to refresh your memory of how it closed, if you will, Paul cries out that he needs outside help. He goes through this despairing litany of how powerless he is to do what he wants to do, but his flesh always seems to win. He cries out for help. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The wages of sin. That was the 24th verse of the last chapter. Now, saying the same thing another way, who is going to, he's saying, who is going to enable me to live for God? If I can't do it by myself, no matter how hard I strive, who's going to bail me out? What's the answer? Anybody have an answer? Huh? Jesus is always a safe answer, specifically the Holy Spirit. That's his job. That's his job. We're going to see here the work of the Trinity. We saw God the Father in creation emphasized in the first three chapters. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, up to verse 20. One of the shocking things in, in, uh, in chapter 1 especially is to realize that the creation itself holds us accountable. That alone is enough. But when we got to chapter th 3... Three through the last chapter was the emphasis was on God the Son in, salv in, in, in salvation. Christ paid your price and mine on that cross. And Paul really develops that in some depth in the chapters 3 through 7. But what we're shifting now, you're going to discover, is um, to shift to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's only been mentioned twice so far in the book of Romans. Casual mention, actually. In this chapter alone, he's going to be mentioned 19 times. That's why I use that for the title of the chapter. This term sanctification is what we're into. Justification is what gets you into heaven. It's your passport's been stamped. And you do that, you get that stamp by doing nothing, zero. That's a, that's, that, that's a disturbing issue, but it's a very real issue. It was all done at the cross that Jesus said, it is finished. To tell us die, paid in full. If you're trying to add to your salvation, uh, you're trying to add to something God's completed, that's blasphemy. 
And again and again, and if you have any doubts about that, not only the book of Romans that we've been saying, read the book of Galatians. That hammers that home. We'll talk more about that. So justification is our entrance pass to heaven. The shocking thing we're going to begin to discover, and this is going to be a shock to many Christians, is that when you get to heaven, you may be very disappointed. <gasps> yeah. You'll be glad, glad you got there, especially in view of the alternative. But to enter is not to inherit. It's disturbing to realize how many Christians presume that everything up there is for everybody. That's not what the Scripture says. We're going to see that show up here in, in Paul's uh, epistle to the Romans. What we're facing, if you're a believer, if you're not a believer, I've got great news for you. The bill's been paid if you'll just accept it. You've got a check that's been signed. You have to cash it, but your check's been signed. It's called justification. But if you're a believer and that's it, you'll discover that you've got a path in front of you called sanctification. Justification declares you not guilty. Terrific. I'm grateful for that. But that doesn't make you righteous. It declares you righteous. There's a difference. Making you righteous is sanctification. That's what we're all about. Sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit in the regenerated life of the believer. Delivering the believer from the power of sin. Justification delivers us from the penalty of sin. We're no longer guilty. We haven't changed, but we're at least not guilty. We've got our card stamped. Great. Sanctification delivers us from the power of sin. And when that's completed, you get to glorification, which is delivering you from even the presence of sin, which is yet future, obviously. We're not delivered from the presence of sin. Pick up the paper. Watch the news. It's astonishing, the decay that we're being plunged into. We, we've been cleaning out some closets, going through some scrapbooks and stuff just about the past, and uh, several of the, I won't get, go bore you with the anecdotal examples, but it's a shock to realize how different our world is today than it was when we were kids. You know, when we were kids, the big problems in school was running in the halls, chewing gum, thing. Today it's carrying guns, keeping your daughter from being raped, and on and on and on. You know, you stop and think about the cesspool that we call society today, and just compare it, not against some theological abstraction, just against life in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever. How different. Not perfect. Oh, heavens, no. But... Compared to today, it's astonishing to see how far we've fallen and continuing to fall. In fact, for people who are in this area, realize that not only are we falling, the rate at which we're falling is accelerating. It's accelerating. We've got major legal organizations trying to get the Ten Commandments out of our culture, trying to make it a crime to mention Jesus Christ in public and that sort of thing where prominent people in Hollywood call themselves post-Americans, whatever that means. Huh? Anyway, moving on. So we have God the Son in salvation, chapters 3 through 7, and then we have the Holy Spirit in sanctification, performing God's will in the life of the believer. Some contrasts, if you will. Chapter 5, just to give you, I want, to, I want you to get a feeling in contrast between chapter 5 and chapter 8. Chapter 5 focused on the saving work of Jesus Christ. Chapter 8 is what Christ did to provide victory in each of our lives. It's one thing to get us saved, justified. It's quite another to give us the power going forward. Follow me? The penalty of the past? Fine. We're not talking about going forward. Chapter 5 pointed out that justification by faith is forever. If you're justified by faith, that card gets you into heaven. Period. No other qualifications. That's it. That's very controversial among some theologians. There's even some church groups, but that's what clearly Paul teaches. Chapter 8, a godly life is ensured through the power of the Holy Spirit. Whoa, wait a minute. That's a whole different thing. Being saved by faith is one thing. That's justification, salvation. The word salvation is a very fuzzy term, so we're going to try to stay away from it and call it more specifically. Justification is by faith forever. But a godly life is something that 
is only attainable and maintainable supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. That's what this whole chapter is all about. Chapter 5 said that performance is based on understanding God's love for us. That's certainly true. You really won't understand any of this unless you really become to grips with the fact that God really loves us more than we have any capacity to imagine. Chapter 8, performance is going to be based on the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to shift very specifically to the mission of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 5 re reveals our relationship to God. Chapter 8 will reveal our relationship to the world, conflict, the flesh, tribulation. See, chapter 5 is our relationship with God. That's in a, in a, is, is, is one thing. Chapter 8 is going to get right down to the nitty-gritty. The realities that confront us moment by moment, day by day. The world, the flesh, the devil, whatever. Chapter 5, the Holy Spirit was mentioned only once in verse 5. In chapter 8, the, Holy, the power is available through the Holy Spirit is developed in fullness to give us assured victory. And there's going to be 19 references to the Holy Spirit in this chapter alone. Chapter 5, the capstone on our salvation in Christ Chapter 8, the capstone on our victory in Christ. Now, you, you sense the difference. I'm trying to tune you in as we go here. So they won't sound just like a lot of platitudes. They'll have reality to you. Romans 8, the high water mark of the epistle of the Romans. That's where we're headed, gang. Now, the first four, four verses that we're going to encounter are really just a summary of the chapter we just, we just finished. They're opening up the truths that were unfolded from chapter 5 through 7, that whole thing. Now, I want to point out something. These chapter divisions, in my view, are not inspired. Now, they were added by Stephen Langton in the 13th century. Now, I know there are many people that venerate the King James translation very highly, and I applaud that. Don't misunderstand me. But they even regard the chapters and verses as inspired. And they may turn out to be right. They argue that the Holy Spirit could have superintended those like he did everything else. Maybe he did. I get the impression personally that the chapter divisions are not bad but miss a few times. Isaiah 53 it starts two verses too late. It should move it up a little. There's several of them. The demarcations are quite clear. So I regard the chapter divisions and verse divisions as convenient reference points, but to take them with a, a bit of caution. And uh, I don't think they're inspired. I'll give you an example of something. Something that floats around a lot. You see, I don't see it much lately, but I used to see a lot of it. It was the Arco volume. This was presumably written by, uh, what was it, uh, Julius Caesar's wife or something, and it had to do with, the, it's a, it was a non-canonical apoc apocryphal document floating around that a lot of people took very seriously. And it's got, it, you, on the websites, there are people that still try to defend it or attack it, whatever, as being real or not real. But I dismiss it very quickly because they're quoting from Isaiah 5, verse 12. That didn't occur in the first century. Those chapter divisions were added in the 13th century. So whoever put, cooked that up, you know, needs to do a little more homework in terms of, of pulling it together. It's, it, 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 uh, not a big deal, but the point is I, 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 I wouldn't make too much of these chapter verse things. But let's just jump right in, having said all that, to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore, that word therefore links this to all the foregoing of, this, of the book. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Period. That's the way it originally was. There's a phrase that some scribe thought they would add to make the transition a little smoother to verse 2. That phrase really shows up where it belongs in verse 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, period. And that's, that's the whole point of Paul's argument, if you've been following his, if you follow his argument. Now, uh, there is therefore now, this is a logical link. One of the things that's deserved a lot of academic attention is the logical structure of this letter. And it's phenomenal. Very complex, very thorough. It's, it, uh, it's bulletproof. But this basically is summarizing... Uh, uh, the arguments that have gone before, everything that's gone before. And this is one of the greatest assurances that a Christian can receive. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, no one 
anyhow, any way can uh, put you under condemnation. No condemnation from any source, for any reason, at any time. And John 3.18 will underscore that for you. If you want to get into that in your notes, fine. There's no qualifying clause. I want you to notice that it does not depend on your walk. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are Christ Jesus. Paul is going to build a perception of an organic union with Christ, if you're a believer in Christ. And that carries with it some awesome attributes that we want to understand. But this is just introducing it here. So this is not how you feel. It's what God says. Now, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, some well-intended scribes seem to add here. It's borrowed from verse 4 that's coming. Probably added, apparently, the earliest manuscripts don't have this. About the 3rd or 4th century it shows up. It's not in any of the older reliable texts. Uh, all the oldest manuscripts agree. It first shows up about the 6th century. Uh, it's not in manuscripts in the 3rd and 4th. Probably added by some well-intended scribe. That's a guess. Not a big deal, except I, I don't want to soften the impact of what Paul's really trying to say here. Because it actually would be a contradiction of what's coming. And so chapter 8 opens with no possibility of condemnation. That should be very precious to you by now, if you understand what that means. Chapter 8 is going to close, astonishingly, with no possibility of separation. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And that starts a tour de force that's unequaled anywhere in the, in the language. We'll get to there. How does one become in Christ? Paul uses that term. It's a Christian cliche. What do you mean being in Christ? What we're talking about is baptism of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that in chapter 6. I'm not getting into the labeling here. People use that term to mean the infilling, which is a repeated thing. No, the baptism of the Spirit is used in the Scripture as a once and for all situation. One baptism emphasized. We went through all that in chapter 6. Go through your notes. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is author authoritative. What that means is that we are in an inseparable organic union with Christ. What on earth does that mean? By the way, do you realize that the cross on that in Judea some 2,000 years ago was the safest place in the universe to be? <laughs> Never thought about that while watching the Passion movie by Bell Gibson, did you? That cross is the safest place in the entire universe to be. And that was validated by the empty tomb three days later. And that's where you and I need to be. Not at the cross, in that, you know, out of that empty tomb, the resurrection life. That's what Paul's going to build here as we go here. Well, we're down to verse 2. We're making progress. Paul says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. This is an echo, a wrap-up, if you will, of chapter 7. There's a great treasure to be discovered by studying the Old Testament. There's a great insight to be gained by studying the Jewish festivals. We need to understand that. Paul tells us, Whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning. He's talking about the Old Testament. He's going to talk about that in chapter 15 when we get there. The dangers there is that people tend to get so enamored with that, they start getting, putting themselves under the law. They miss the point of our liberty in Christ. And that's what he's starting to talk about here. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. Does that mean you go and murder? Of course not. Does that mean you, should, you, 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 don't, you don't keep the Sabbath day? No, you can keep the Sabbath day. It's a great celebration. You won't really understand the creation until you understand how a Jew deals with Shabbat. But you're not under the law. You don't have 613 commandments that you have to sweat. You, in fact, well, we'll get, in, we'll get in that more. This summarizes Romans 7, if you will. Okay. While the law of sin and death will be in us as long as we're in this body, it's still, there's a struggle inside us because that hasn't gone away. We're just free of it. It doesn't have dominion. We have a choice. That choice is a continual struggle in our nature because the sin nature is still there, the flesh is still there, but we have an alternative. And that alternative is a, a choice we make moment by moment. The law of the spirit of life. And it's a genitive case. It's the law or law principle of the life-giving spirit. It's a continual thing. It's not a once and for all. It's a continual kind of thing. 
abiding in him. That, that's what is called an organic union. If you want to understand that, put down John 15, first half dozen verses, where he talks about, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And he talks about, Jesus himself talks about this organic union with him if you're in him. And uh, we'll keep moving, but that's available to you as you take your time to devotionally follow up on this. The organic union. You know, it's interesting to see how this is anticipated even in the Old Testament idioms. The menorah. All, you all know the menorah, right? You've seen the symbol of the tabernacle. It's the only source of light in the tabernacle. As you went into the holy place on the left side, there was the menorah. It's interesting, I am the vine, ye are the branches. The one plus six makes the completion of seven. How interesting that is. It's interesting that there are three feasts in the first month of the religious year. There are three feasts in the seventh month. The three feasts, all, all those feasts are prophetic, not just memorial. First three of the, are prophetic of his first coming, the last three of his second coming, and there's this strange one in the middle. Is the only place that leavened bread is ordained to be used has a Gentile flavor. The Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. That's the day that the church was born on. And it may be the day that the church is caught up. We'll see. But there's a... It's interesting, this whole idea of the organic union with Christ is embodied in some of the idioms. We speak of the body of Christ. That's a phrase we use for the collective believers. It's more than just a rhetorical term. I think it was, it's my understanding that G.H. Pember, um, just a, a decade or two after the turn of the century, in his writings, he was the first to recognize that in, you know, in Revelation chapter 12, we have the woman giving birth to the man-child. The woman is Israel, the man-child, of course, is Christ, who so is going to rule the nation with a rod of iron, all that's in there. The identity is pretty clear, despite some people who publish odd, odd, odd views about it, but that, anyway, it is what it is. Um, but in verse chapter 5, we have the man-child. The woman gives birth to the man-child. In verse 6 of chapter 12, the man-child is caught up to God in his throne. And most of us, when we read that, the Re Revelation 12 is just a summary of the whole, his whole history of Israel, if you will. Um, when we read that, we visualize that referring to the ascension of Christ. As he's given birth, the woman gives birth to the Messiah, and then the Messiah is caught up to God in his throne. And that, of course, links to Hosea 5.15, where he says, I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. Because God, he, Christ came to offer the kingdom. They turned him down. He says, okay, I'll come back later, in effect. But that, when he's caught up to God in his throne, it was G.H. Pember that first considered the possibility, and I think he's absolutely right, by the way, that that may have in view in that same verse, not only the ascension of Christ, but the rapture of the church. Because what follows it is what follows the rapture. It, it, it all fits in a surprising way. And uh, begin the idea is, well, it's just one body. Yes, but so is the body of Christ, one body. There's another place that shows up. And by the way, I mentioned we're going to look, be, before we get through, we're going to notice that not everybody who enters heaven inherits, and we're going to deal with that shortly. But Enoch, we know from Genesis 5, was translated before the flood of Noah. There are three groups of people that faced the judgment. Those that perished in the judgment of the flood, those that were preserved through the flood, and those that were removed prior. In that sense, Enoch would appear to be a, uh, a, 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 a type of the church. You say, well, that's just one guy. Yes, but the church is one body. That's the reason I bring it up here. Possibility. A possibility. Let's move on to verse 3. And what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Nothing wrong with the law. What's wrong is us. The law is perfect. The law is holy. It's just not able to save. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin. Condemned sin in the flesh. There's a lot in that, there's a lot in that verse. Man. What the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Okay. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin. For sin as a principle, as a control, as a, a, a thing altogether. This is a summary of chapters 6 and 7. The flesh is the term for ourselves. Us. The flesh will always fail. Chuck Missler, 
will always fail. It was Chuck Missler trying to do it. Christ died not only for my sins, but for the sinner, that is, for the sin nature. Not only for my sins, but for my nature. That's heavy. That's the whole thing. For every one of us. And in the likeness of sinful flesh, he was truly human. There's nothing that he, there's no way that he lacked anything being human. He's born of a virgin. That's why we have the virgin birth. He became man in every sense of the term. Except without sin, he was the perfect man. He's the ultimate man. The ultimate victor. Now the virgin birth is an essential part of all of this. And from here we could depart a whole study of that. I'll spare you this time. But it starts at Genesis 3.15 when God declares war on Satan. And that the victor of that war is going to come from the seed of the woman. It becomes the title of Christ. Sin of the, sin of the, the seed of the woman. That's a contradiction in biology as well as grammar. The seed is the man, not the woman, and so on. But that, that's the first hint of the virgin birth, which is then amplified in Isaiah 7.14. It also is a, the a springboard from the blood curse of Jeconiah that we study, from Jeremiah 22.30 and so on. Very, very key theme to understand all the way through the Scripture. And uh, now in verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Our identity is with the Spirit, not the flesh. To the extent that we rely on the flesh, we're retreating into a loser's posture. That, see, that's the purpose clause. All that has been said up to now converges on this fact, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Wow, the righteousness of the law be fulfilled in us? Yes, because we're going to walk after Christ. That amplifies Christ. The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, not by us. We don't have the capability to do that. We do not have the capability to do that in our own flesh. <laughs> I was walking through a hotel lobby one time, and I overheard somebody say, Hey, there's Chuck Mister in the flesh. I turned back and said, He's always in the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would have been kidding. Yeah, yeah. Who walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. What do I mean by that, walk in the flesh? By not trying by our own efforts. If you're trying by yourself, you're losing. Well, I'm going to do better, strike one. I'm doing as best as I can, strike two. And this is not an imperative, by the way. This is a, uh, a um, indicative st uh, structure, it's a statement of fact, not an imperative. The righteous law might be filled with us. And that's Galatians 5, 16 says the same thing, but there it is an imperative. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of flesh. That's an imperative. That's a command in Galatians. No, this is a statement of fact. We're talking here about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's a glib cliche. Let's understand what that really means. Verses 5 through 25, uh, 27 is going to develop a wide range of truth regarding the fact that the Holy Spirit indwells you. Now, to really understand how mind-blowing that thought is, you need to understand that to Paul himself, it blew a fuse. He was a trained Pharisee. He understood that the Holy Spirit would come and go as he willed. Saul, King Saul, had it for a while and God took it away. David could pray before God, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. We may read Psalm 51, but we can't pray that prayer. The thing that blew Paul's mind the discovery that in this peculiar time, excuse the expression, but in this particular dispensation, the Holy Spirit's given without repentance, without being recalled. He may take you out of the ball game, like Ananias and Sapphira, but if you've got the Holy Spirit, you can't lose it. He's, a, he's, he's considered sealing you for your future. The indwelling Holy that, 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 that concept becomes so glib that we, may, we, we, we need to understand what it's really saying. Verses 5 to 7 can emphasize the impossibility of living by any system of resources other than the Holy Spirit. You can't do it. The, the end thereof is death. We'll talk about six different types of death soon. Positive thinking ain't going to cut it. Positive confession. Hal Lindsey likes to call this Avis Christianity. Try harder, you know. 
we're trying harder. That used to be their byline, you know. And uh, they usually, they often talk. I suspect that this anecdote comes from the, Midwest, uh, from the Northwest United States. The guy went down to the hardware store and saw an ad there that it was, it had this chainsaw that you, you can knock off a couple of cords in a day pretty easy with it. And so he bought it. I thought it was great. The next day, he came back to the hardware store and said, I was all exhausted. He said, I've been, I worked, the yeah, best I could do is half a cord. I want my money back. Oh, you got to try it. You, you got to try, try it again. It'd take another time. So he, another day, he took it and he came back and again and says, best I can do is a little over half a cord. I can't, I can't even do a full cord. So there's something wrong. And so the guy says, let's go in the back. And so they go back behind the hardware store and the guy pulls the cord, you know, start that. And the guy says, what's that noise? <laughs> He was trying to do it without running it, you know. Not, not taking advantage of the power that he... You know, that's a clumsy anecdote, but you get the idea. Too many of us haven't pulled the start, starting cord. We try harder. <laughs> yeah, that's why we're always second best, right? Anyway. Paul continues, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they are after the Spirit. They, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. What do you mind? That word, ter that term is used, it's not mind like brain, it's like your mother said, mind me now, right? What are you minding? Are you minding the flesh? Are you providing for the needs of the flesh? Or are you <laughs> minding the Spirit? Minding the things of the Spirit? That's the question he's posing here. Flesh here is just the term for human resources. And the contrast here is between two believers. We're not talking about a contrast between a believer and a non-believer. We're talking about one believer who's taking advantage of the empowering and the other that doesn't. The impossibility of trying to live for God by human effort versus those that are truly walking by the Spirit. I won't ask for a show of hands. But I'm going to encourage you to examine your own life. Are you walking by the flesh or by the Spirit? If you're trying to walk by the flesh, you're, gonna, you're, you're fumbling it. You're losing it. You're missing the resource that you already have at your disposal. Who is controlling you? Is it the flesh or the spirit? The human view viewpoint, you know, that's your capability, or God's viewpoint, his ability through you. Which one is driving you? Which one is driving you? And if you want to See some of these things in practical terms. Don't look at my stuff. Look at my wife's. She's got a classic text on this. The Way of Agape and the Be Transformed. Two texts on this area that are world-renowned. Been out for years, and, 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 and I encourage you to take a look at those. And sincerity, you need to realize, of course, is not the basis. There were 19 guys on September 11th of 2001 that were very sincere. More sincere than we have any capacity to imagine. That didn't cut it. That didn't cut it. Sincerity isn't the issue. The basis is the issue. Is your mind on the things of the Spirit or the things of this, of this world? Or to be carnally minded is death, and but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And that's where we get this term, carnal Christian. Christians that are saved, they believe in Christ, they're justified. But their life is driven by self-effort. Self-effort. The Greek, by the way, is far more blunt in this verse. For the mind, uh, that means being under the domination of, the flesh is death. The mind, or being under the domination of the spirit, is life and peace. It's the genitive case in both cases. It's the ownership thing. These are both believers. Death means here, out of fellowship. It doesn't mean death there's six different kinds of death. We'll talk about that. Six different... The word death is used several different ways. There is, of course, physical death, we were, where the soul leaves the body. The medical types have a slightly different definition, but it's not that different. Physical death, okay? Now, we might talk about that for a moment. Um, I have a computer up here. And if you knew everything there is to know about every piece of, every wire, every part, every physical aspect of the computer that's behind this thing, could you tell me anything about its behavior? Not really. 
because the hardware is simply an environment within which software resides. What determines its behavior, the colors, the letters, whatever, is software, not hardware, right? Now, the, uh, there's an analogy here that's very, very, very useful. See, my problem is, is that I look out at you, out here, and I can't really see you. I can see the temporary hardware that you're resident in. The real you, call it soul, spirit, give it what labels you like. The real you is software, not hardware. You can look at this computer, examine it, you can make x-rays of it, do whatever you like with it. You can't tell what software is running there unless you have a way of analyzing the software that's there. Now, um, the real you is software, not hardware. Now, I want to talk a little bit about software. Um, if I have a blank disk, I'm using here a CD-ROM, familiar to most of you at this point, and I put it on a postal scale, and it will weigh pretty precisely seven-tenths of an ounce, including the packaging I've got here. Now, if I take, this is a blank one. If I take one that's been recorded, I have one here that has 24 hours of visual and audio presentation and notes. It's got 1,500 computer-aided diagrams. It's a fully loaded CD-ROM, right? This one cost me, I don't know, 50 cents maybe. And this one, on a retail basis, might cost you 30 or 40 dollars. And it weighs seven-tenths of an ounce. One has no software on it. The other one is, in some sense, is fully loaded with software. What do they weigh? Each one weighs the same. See, software has no mass. Now, why am I giving... He said, well, what's that guy doing? Bear with me here. We know from, thanks to Dr. Einstein, that time is a physical property. It varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity. Software has no mass. Now some of you, me, have a little too much mass. <laughs> but that's the environment that we're resident in. The real you is software, not hardware. So this software, I can send through the airwaves. I can send it through the airwaves. It has no mass. Therefore, it has no time. The real you is eternal whether you like it or not. Time has no meaning. The real you is timeless. It's eternal. The problem is where you're going to spend it. And there's two plans where you can spend it. If you're perfect, you never make a mistake, you never sin. Go through your whole life from beginning to end and never make a mistake. When you get to heaven, you go up to the throne and say, move over. Now there's two of us. That didn't go over, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Plan B, of course, is to have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. And that's what we're talking about, right? Physical death. That's when the soul leaves the body. And I'm going to suggest to you a soul is soft. You know, many years ago, when I was early in the ministry, I had a computer that was black and white. It was, uh, I forgot who made it, not important. And I, because I travel a lot and I write a lot, I live with my laptop. And this laptop that I had finally died. I mean, it was just, it was over. And some friends of the ministry had realized how indebted I am to that kind of an appliance, treated me to, at the time, the top of the line new laptop. That was my big deal. I got, and I loaded it with all my favorite things, all my favorite little crutches and stuff that I use. And it all came up recognizably, except it came up in color. <laughs> that was wild. That was neat, you know. And it came up, you know, about probably 10 or 20 times faster than the previous one. And the reason I'm bringing this up is, do you realize that you and I are scheduled for an upgrade? That's going to make that one look silly, you know. Paul, uh, John tells, 1 John 3, 2, We know, beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be. 
But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. That's a statement in hyperdimensions, but anyway, move on. Spiritual death is separation of the human spirit from the soul. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Heavy stuff, way over our heads. Remember in Matthew chapter 8, verse 22, Jesus said to them, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. Everybody had this excuse, I've got to go bury my this and that, whatever. Hey, let the dead bury their dead. I should use that every time someone invites me to attend a funeral, but I won't, okay. <laughs> And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, and he goes on with his argument. Being dead in their sins. So we've got physical death, we've got spiritual death. Ah, we've got sexual death. Ooh, really? Yeah. Romans 4, 19, being not weak in the faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He's talking about, you know, uh, uh, Sarah and Abraham. Her womb was considered dead. That is not dead in the sense that you and I would use it in other contexts, but this is uh, uh, not, no longer uh, forthcoming. Then there's positional death. Positional death. Romans 6, we ran into it a couple chapters ago. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The resurrection life we call it, right? For if we have been planted together in the likeness of death, we shall, also, uh, be, sh we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So there again, the death is used in another, in another context. And then we have operational death in Ephesians 5. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Boy, does that fit us, huh? Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, and so on. And unto the angel, this is Revelation chapter 3, unto the angel of the church at Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. That's an identifier from chapter 1 of Revelation. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Boy, the church at Sardis. If the, church, if the church of Thyatira represents the medieval church, church at Rome or whatever, then Sardis would represent the, Reform the Re Reformation, which was incomplete, unfortunately. Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Heavy stuff. It's one of the two letters of the seven that has nothing good said about it. Hebrews chapter 6, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and a faith toward God, going on. Time to move on. And down to verse 14, says, now, uh, chapter 9, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through, through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How tragic it is to see how many people are committed to dead works, works that are of the flesh, as, as high-sounding as they might seem. If they're not done by the Spirit of God, they'll count as nothing. And then we have the second death. This is the heavy one. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. But they shall be the priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. He, that's born one, he, he that is born once will die twice. He that's born twice will die once because the first one was taken care of on that cross 2,000 years ago, if you're baptized in Christ. So we have the second death. Okay. Many uses for the term death, so be alert to that. And uh, the verse that we just talked about in verse 6 refers to operational temporal death, if you will. For to be carnal mind is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. This is Romans 7, summarizing again. Remember how he said, these things that I hate I keep doing? And that which I would, I do not. And that which I would not, that I do. Remember that? Well, that's, this is really what he's saying. It's the carnal mind. It's an enmity with God. 
The flesh will never be improved. Nowhere in the Bible is the flesh improved. Nowhere in the Bible is the heart cured. It's replaced with a new one. We are power. You and I are powerless to change our nature. That's a God thing. We cannot, in our own efforts, really please God. We don't have the capacity. He alone is the source of power for holiness. Nowhere else. No rules, no rituals are not empowering. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's the summary of the first eight verses. In the flesh, that is under the domination of the flesh. To be proud is to be blind, as suggested by Newell. A good, good summary. To be discouraged is unbelief. Are you discouraged? That's interesting. That's unbelief. Really? To be disappointed in yourself means you relied on yourself. Big mistake, step one. You bet on the wrong, you bet on the wrong horse, huh? To hope is better, to, 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 to hope to better is to fail to see yourself in Christ only. The hope to be better. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But, or however is another way of saying it, in, in under the dominion of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. His mission is to reveal Christ, the Holy Spirit. That's what he mentions in John 16. Jesus lays that out. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. But the question is, is he in control? Is he in control? Have you given him the keys to run the thing? Do you have the Spirit of Christ in you? Are you in the power of his presence? Those are questions you need to ask. And if so, do you take advantage of it? That's, what, that's, the, that's the challenge of Romans 8. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Back there in Romans 6, a couple of sessions ago, knowing this first, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We should not serve sin. Whose righteousness are we relying on? Not ours, his. His. And the word destroyed means rendered powerless. That sin might be, in your body might be rendered powerless. Now we get to these if statements. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. That's why the empty tomb is so crucial. This is if. There are four classes of conditionals in the Greek. This is the first class. Let me... The four classes. The first class is if and it so, we would translate that since or indeed. If that's happened, it's if in the sense that since we know that's true, this following follows. That's class one conditional in the Greek. There's another if, if and it's not so, where you're reasoning from contrary to fact subjunctives. That's a different class in the Greek. The third one is may, if maybe it's so and maybe it's not. It's indeterminate. It, it's subjective. And there's a fourth class, if I wished it was so, but it probably not. <laughs> it's also a form of subjective. Those are the four classes. The point is that Greek is the most explicit language ever devised. Every verb has to meet five conditions. It's incredibly rigid, therefore incredibly precise. You can always say who's saying what to whom and who's getting the action and whether it's certain or not, or continuing, or past and finished, or it, it goes on and on and on. It isn't just the, the past, present, future, and it isn't just the active and past. There's just active and past. There's a third voice. There's active voice. That's where the subject receives the action. There's a passive voice where the uh, active voice where the, sub, the, the, the subject, the verb, the action is provided by the subject. There's the passive voice where the subject receives the action of the verb. In Greek, you have the optive voice where you can have both. And so it's a different kind. Of, it's, a, it's a hugely more expressive environment to, to, for precision. And that's why the Lord, I think, chose it for the New Testament. So, okay, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus, so this is the first class. In other words, since the spirit of him raised up Jesus from there, this is arguing from something that we know happened. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Because he did it there, he'll do it to you, is what he's saying. 
indwells, takes up residence in. That's present tense, continuous process. Paul, ostensibly blameless before the law, exclaimed, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of death? That's the thing I used as the opening here. And um, so that's um, the answer, of course, <laughs> is here. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. You owe the flesh nothing. We owe the flesh nothing. We are not its debtors. Since victory, not since victory is guaranteed by Christ. It's guaranteed by Christ. Galatians 2.20, you've often heard it. Paul can say this. I have to throw it in here. He says, I am, Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's That's the crucified life. For if I live after the flesh, continuing in Romans, and live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Oh boy. We're focusing on the exchanged life. Living his life in us rather than trying to live our own. And this is a summary of verse 6, 7, and 8 so far. More coming. If you keep, after, keep on living after the flesh, ye shall keep on dying, is what he's saying. The word die is in the present tense, continuing. And of course, he's talking about operational death here. The deeds, mortify the deeds of the body. The word deeds is praxis. The deeply ingrained habit is what the word deeds implies there. A deeply ingrained habit. And this, of course, echoes the command of chapter 6 back there. Empowered by the Spirit, mortify. It's active voice. It requires volition on our part. Active voice. To mortify the deeds. We need to exercise volition regarding our deeply ingrained habits. That's what he's saying. You have the power to do so now. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now it's interesting that no child of God can be happy living for the things in the flesh. People are living uh, for the that are, well, by the Spirit of God cannot be um, happy. The best example is the prodigal son. The prodigal son couldn't handle living among the pigs. That's why he swallowed his pride and went home and, and so on. You know the story, obviously. But what do you, you want to understand here what the sonship means. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are, they are the sons of God. Present tense, continually. Continue the sense of God. It's passive voice. The subject receives the action. And the word son here is huios. It's an adult son. It's not a child. The one, if, in Luke 15, I'll, I'll be interested in time, I won't jump into Luke 15, um, but that's the prodigal son. You all know the story. How he took his, he insulted his family by taking his inheritance, went off to live a wanton life. He finally degrades to the point where he's uh, uh, serving uh, pigs and realizes that even the lowest person in his household at home did better as he's doing there. So he went home just to accept that. When he got home, of course, they celebrated his arrival. What's interesting about that whole story, yes, he lost his inheritance because he's better away. He never, ever lost his sonship. Never lost his sonship. That's one of the points there. Verse 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, <laughs> this requires a little bit of comment. Um, in Roman, Greco-Roman law, adoption was required even of a legitimate son in order to inherit. When you were a child, you were under tutors and so forth, you were treated like a servant. But the day came when you formerly were adopted by your father, where you became inherited. If you were not a legitimate son, you could be adopted and have the rights of a legitimate son by being adopted. Once adopted, by the way, that was irreversible. That was irreversible. But the term of adoption here is used in that Roman sense. We think of adoption in a very different way in our society where someone takes on a child to be their parents, fine. The word adoption in their culture was a normal procedure for someone advancing through uh, his, his advancement in the household. And it would determine what he inherited. 
And uh, so, and we also have this interesting phrase, Abba, Father. And uh, so this adoption was typically held in the forum. The ceremony was called the adoption. And after being adopted, they could never be disowned. Until they were, when they were adopted, what determined what they inherited. But they could never be disinherited. So when we receive the spirit of adoption, that's exciting. What Paul is saying, see, it has huge impact in, in, in the context that Paul is dealing with here. All born into his family were children. Only those that were adopted were recognized as sons. That's part of the dynamic that's going on here. Now I want to talk a little bit about the Hebrew language. Uh, the Hebrew language is distinctive. You know, we, we know about picture, pictural languages like Chinese. They have pictures, and that's, that's, a, that's a very cumbersome form of language that they're trying to extricate themselves from. But the Hebrew alphabet is distinctive. We think of alphabets as being phonetic, carrying the sound. If we know how the thing's spelled, we can pretty much pronounce it, with some exceptions, yeah. But see, those are phonemes. That's sound. The Hebrew language alphabet is phonetic, but it's also conceptual. In other words, phonemes are a unit of sound. Semim is a unit of meaning. And the Hebrew alphabet conveys not just sound, it conveys meaning. All Hebrew words are built on three-letter roots. And if you understand the roots, you, you can pretty much figure out what the, what the word means. Now, let's take the first letter of their alphabet. This is the Aleph. And up the right side, you see how it's written today. What you need to have a glimpse of is how it used to be written before Babylon. And it was written like uh, a longhorn ox. It was an ox's head. That's where Aleph, it was the first letter, and it was also the ox. It meant strength, or first, you see. In fact, that Aleph, later it migrates to become what we, our lowercase a. You can still see, you can sort of see how it came out of a, uh, a representation of an ox's head. But anyway, so it's, it was originally writ, written like an ox's head. It means strength or leader, or being first. So an aleph carries across the concept of first or strength or leader. No problem so far. Let's take the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That's a bet, a bet. And uh, you remember Hebrew always goes, all languages east of Jerusalem go from right to left, right? All languages or countries west of Jerusalem go from left to right, right? We've covered that before, I think, right? Okay. Um, I think that's, I know what you're going to do with that piece of information. Okay. And you can see how this thing turned on one side can become our B eventually, okay? But in any case, the bet. It's originally written sort of like a tent or a teepee. It means house. Bethlehem, house of bread. Bethel, house of God. Bet itself means like house. Okay? House or family that lives in the house, either way. Now, if you take those two letters together, an aleph and a bet, you get an ab, and that is the leader of the house, right? It makes sense? That's the father, right? The leader of the house, ab. You take the intimate form of that, that's abba, like daddy, Abba, Father. It's an intimate call to it. So still, it's up in the Aramaic, but all right. It's a, a term of endearment, if you will. But I want you to notice how the concepts are embodied in the language itself. Remember, Jesus cried, Abba, Father, in Gethsemane. And Paul is calling Abba, Father, here where we're adopted by him. Let me show you one other letter, and then we'll stop this. But another letter is the He, the breath. You remember in Pygmalion, George Bernard Shaw's novel about the uh, Liza Doolittle who kept dropping her H's. It was made into a, a musical called My Fair Lady, remember? And how Henry Higgins, the coach, was trying to get her to get to pronounce her H's. In Hartford, Hereford, and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly happen. And she had to do that to blow out the, you know, the fl flames of it. The hay. And you, you can tell from this hay where we get our H, right? There's two theories. One is that's an open window, and the other is that it's holding hands up, whatever. But it's hands lifted up or open window. It means behold or revealed. It also means breeze or wind or spirit. The he is a breath. The he is simply a breath. That makes sense, doesn't it, right? Well, kind of interesting. 
If you take the Aleph and the Bet, remember the A and the B, the Aleph and the Bet together made Ab the Father, right? If you put the He in the middle of it, you're communicating the essential essence of the Father. What is the essential essence of the Father? The word for love. Ahab is the Hebrew word for love. But you see how hidden behind the word are the very constructs that make up the semi, the meaning of the word father and or love. Now, when Abraham and Sarah had their names changed, remember Abraham, Abraham and Sarah, that was before, at Genesis 17, things change. God changes the name of Abraham to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah. What does he do? He simply puts a hey, and he puts the Spirit of God in them. So it becomes Abraham, the breath of the, the, the Holy Spirit. Sarai becomes Sarah. But you're just simply adding a hey to the end of it. So again, it's, it, it just, once you get a glimpse of this, not to make a career of it, but so you have a respect for the original language. And whenever you translate, you lose something. That's why there's a value in being able to somehow reach through the translation and find out what was really said. And you can do that today with most modern helps without having to know Hebrew or Greek. Because there are all kinds of free software packages that will operate even on your little PDAs or on your laptops or whatever. I travel with about 35 translations in my laptop. And uh, uh, I can put my cursor on any word and it will give me the background and diagram the sentence and all that if you want. And you don't have to know Hebrew or Greek to do that. So, so the Hebrew language is very strange. They, they're ideograms and phonemes together. The thing is self-parsing. You don't have to have space between the words because there's five letters that have a different form if they're the last um, uh, letter in the sentence. So the thing is self-parsing. The vowels are inferred, which means it's been designed to resist in, uh, 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 jamming. And uh, it maximizes the available bandwidth that is available. So it's been designed to anticipate hostile jamming. So it's astonishing to discover how much engineering is implicit in this language, unique among all languages on the planet Earth. Moving on, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The word, the word there is technon, that's a born one, is what it really means. And yet we have this children of God, now, or sons of God, Benaiha Elohim, that, we show, that shows up in um, Genesis 6. It's a term used for direct creations of God, which of course are angels. All through the Old Testament, that term is used for angels. But in John chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, it says of Jesus, He came unto His own, His own received Him not. But to as many as received Him, to them gave He, he gave them the power to become, what? The sons of God. A direct creation of God. That's what that word really means. So you're a direct creation of God if you're regenerated. You're not, your heart isn't cured, it's replaced. You're a new creation in Christ. Those aren't just rhetorical devices. They're very, very fundamental issues. And uh, the Spirit itself beareth witness. The Greek here requires a neuter pronoun because the word Spirit, pneuma, is a neuter noun. And uh, in English, it is correct to use the pronoun, he. He communicates with our spirits, he illumines, he instructs, and he guides. The fact that it's a neuter noun becomes very important when you do an exegetical study of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, where the to identify the Holy Spirit as the restrainer and so on. Verse 17, the last verse of the night, evening, and if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. Whew. If we're children, then heirs, heirs of God, and what? Joint heirs with Christ? We have no capacity to imagine what that means. We're going to be joint. He's going to inherit the universe. We're going to be joint heirs with him? You've got to be kidding. But there's a phrase. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now I say, well, on the one hand, we can't imagine what that means. But I want you to notice this is a conditional reward. I'm going to suggest to you the possibility that many who arrive in heaven will be sorely disappointed. That shatters many people's conception. Not everybody in heaven is going to be equal. There is a thing called the Bema Seat of Christ, a judgment seat, like, a, like an athlete's award ceremony. And certain people are going to get wonderful rewards, and some won't. 
In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, highlight that if you built on the, by through the Spirit on stuff that's incombustible, you'll, you'll survive. If you've built on combustibles, they're going to get burned. You'll be saved, but like as by a refugee from a fire, you know. And so, if so be, we'll be joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And um, this is becoming very important to Nan and I as we study these things because um, we're beginning to realize that there is a role and a... And a, a, a opportunity to be what, what, the, what the Scripture calls an overcomer. There are seven promises in the seven letters of seven churches to overcomers. And those are rewards. It's not a question of salvation. As we're talking to churches, the, the concept is, it, what the belief's already there, presumably. Uh, no, it's, it's talking about a conditional reward. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul, who certainly was an expert on eternal security, because he's going to hammer that. Bef bef he's going to handle that, ha hammer that in a way that's unexcelled in the rest of this chapter. In fact, that's one of the most encouraging places to retreat to when you just need a pickup is to read the last half of Romans eight. So Paul understood the eternal security. When you're, if you're secure in Christ, you are secure. And yet, if you read his letters to Timothy and elsewhere, you discover he lived his life almost as a, in paranoia. For he, that he might be a castaway. Is he talking about losing his salvation? No. He's talking about missing his opportunity for inheritance. And the thing that we don't have a grasp of as typical Christian students is that your, sal your justification is certain Christ did it all. That's your entry ticket. That doesn't mean you inherit. You can walk into a hotel, you can enter a hotel, that doesn't mean you inherit the hotel. Try moving a wall or something, you know. So, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Rewards. Will all who enter inherit? And what is this, what are, who are these metakoi that the Bible talks about? Sharing and partaking. It's a term for partner and work officer dignity. We're going to talk about that before this chapter is over. I'm just setting the stage for the next session. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 to 15. Essential reading to understand. Why do Christians have trials? This is also a place for as you review your notes to go through the Christian trials. Why do Christians have trials? To glorify God. Discipline for known sin. Those are different issues. To prevent us from falling into sin. That's one reason we have trials, to keep us out of even bigger sins. To keep us from pride. That's, Paul had that experience, of course. You have trials to keep you from pride. Probably he had that eyesight problem, we suspect. To build faith. One reason we have trials is to build faith. That's what my wife's book Faith in the night season is all about the ultimate call to intimacy. To cause growth. All of us grow by those trials. No pain, no gain. huh? To teach obedience and discipline. Yes, Paul, God loves us, so he'll take us to the woodshed when he thinks it'll do some good. He also gives us trials to prepare us to comfort others that might have the same trial. To prove the reality of Christ in us. And for a testimony to the angels, surprisingly enough. That's a review thing from a previous session. But in the context of what we're talking about here, it's a good time to review that. The ten different reasons. I'm in dead to Hal, uh, Hal Lindsey's book, Combat Faith, for this particular list. But you can make your own list. There's, so thus we head to the next session. I want you to savor the rest of Romans 8. Read it attentively for the next session. Are the entropy laws, the laws of thermodynamics, are they the result of the curse in Genesis 3? We'll talk about that. And what are the three most important words in the famous verse, Romans 8, 28? What are the three most important words in that in verse? And I want you to make a list of what can separate us from the love of Christ. God's paradigm will be talked about. Are you foreknown, predestinated, called, justified, and glorified? What on earth is going on there? If you're predestinated, does that make it inevitable? If it's, ine if it's inevitable, do you have choice? Is there, is there a tension between the concept of predestination and, and uh, free will? Philosophers, philosophers have argued about that for thousands of years. The concept of being prophesied and certain seems to militate against us having any prerogatives. 
Let's talk, we'll talk about that next time. Some of the basic, basic truths of the, you know, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.